Good morning, everybody. Um, it's 11 that they're here. Uh, it is uh, 9 that they're there. But we are all in Africa. More important is that you and me are brothers and sisters in the Lord because we belong to the same God. We belong to the same Savior. I think it's important for us to learn that uh, although I'm from Kenya and you are from Nigeria, we are closer together because of our destiny than you are with your, with your uncle or your relative. Because the moment we have committed ourselves to God, our values change. And they become very different from our tribal values or our clan values. And we now become closer to people whose destiny we share. So I'm, I'm your brother in the Lord. Our discussion today is on Tent making in missions. We'll do part one today and do part two at another time. Let me start by saying that this is not a strange thing to me. I can still remember being asked in 1988 to talk in a mission conference on tent making because by that time I had been doing it for many years. I left the university in 1977. So it's, it's, 45, it's more than 45 years ago since I graduated from the university. And I graduated having been the chairman of the University of Christian Union in 1975. Those days, of course, every country seemed to, to have only one university. So Kenya had only one university. And so I was the chairman in 1975-76, then left the university in 77. And in my mind... I did not feel called to be a pastor, but I knew I was called to evangelize. I knew that all of us who are Christians are called to evangelism. And therefore, it did not matter what job I did. I knew that one day, God will hold me accountable for what I do. I, the first job I did was in a development bank, giving people money at a fee. Then after that, I joined another company called Shell. Shell is also in your country. And I worked for Shell until they called me an old man. And I retired. Then after that, I registered um, a consultancy firm where I consult in management and leadership. And um, I have been doing that now for several, several years. But in all those years, I've always been preaching. I've always been witnessing. I've always been writing books. At least now, I, I wrote books even as I was working for Shell. And um, now that, that I retired, I have put more time to books. I've written 21 books, most many of them, that are dealing with this subject. I wrote, the first book I wrote was, because people kept asking me, why are you not a pastor? Brother Nganga, you have been preaching all these years. Why are you not a pastor? So I wrote a book to answer the question. And that the book that our brother has mentioned it is called um, Marketplace, it's about Marketplace Christianity, but we are talking about the Christian professional leading in the marketplace. And it's a bit biographical. If you're interested in the book, just go to Amazon and check for uh, the book under John Nganga, the writer being John Nganga, you'll find it. But if you, if you, it may be easier to just go to my website. My website is by my name www.johnganga.org If you go there, it will give you a link to the book in Amazon and you can buy it in, in Amazon. It's cheaper when it's a digital, digital book. Then after that, I wrote another book still in the same area, which is um, Work Ethics. In other words, how a Christian professional will work. Because Christian tent makers are people who are working. So I wrote a book on, on, um, on work ethics. Then after that, I wrote a book on stewardship to mention to you that whatever God has given you is actually a, a stewardship responsibility. So even as a worker, you must know that you are doing it for God. That is not just people who work in the church work for God. Even those who work like me who work in all industry, they are working for God and God who hold us accountable. And it, it will be very, very important that we understand, we understand that. Then, not during COVID, I wrote another book called 
uh, marketplace leadership, uh, Nehemiah style. And it's just to show you that Nehemiah was not a priest. Nehemiah was uh, not a prophet. Nehemiah was a professional working, because contracting a world is actual engineering work. But at the same time, he had impact, not just in construction, but he had impact on the people of God. Just go, you, again, you can pick the book it to it will help you. Then finally, I wrote a book on help emphasizing that if you really call yourself a Christian professional, the way to attract people to God's kingdom is to behave differently at work. And the book is called Integrity, the Litmus Test of Good Leadership. So I'm giving you all that so that given that I don't have a lot of time, you can understand it's a big subject and it can be approached in many ways. Let me answer the question. Who is a tent maker? You know, we need to understand that all of us are called by God. But not all of us are called to work in the church. We each need to be using the gifts God has given us in whichever way God has called us. And we need both church employees and tent makers. One is not better than the other. So those of us who work in the church are serving the Lord. Those of us who work in industry are also serving the Lord. It's only some are called church employees, others are called tent makers. All of us are servants of God. Isn't that the message we get in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Whose witness? Christ's witness. Number one in Jerusalem. Then in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But I want you to skip from verse 8 to go to verse 15. Verse 15 says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. The reason I'm reading verse 15 is you understand who was being addressed by Jesus in verse 8. It is the believers. And the Bible puts in bracket a group numbering about 120. In other words, the Great Commission in, first, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is not addressed to the 12, although by that time there were 11, because Judas had um, already died. It's not addressed to the 11. It's addressed to the whole church, 120. So among them, some are fishermen, some are farmers. Not only the apostles themselves were, were involved in ministry, uh, full time. But all, all the 120 were told, hey, stay in Jerusalem. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How shall we know, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit has come? You know why? You are not help but witness. When you receive the power from the Holy Spirit, when he has come upon you, you cannot miss it. Why? You can't help but witness. So you need to understand that irrespective of the job you are doing, irrespective of your career, you cannot call yourself a Christian and not be a witness. Of course, you may not be a pastor. You may not be an apostle. You may not be those, those titles. Whatever, whether you're an engineer or a doctor, God expects that in your engineering or your medicine, Acts 1.8 is yours. That's why I've read verse 15. So you understand it's not about the 11. It's about the whole church. The whole church must be involved in witnessing. And therefore, tent makers are just a title where you differentiate tent makers from the people who work and are paid by the church. So, for example, if you are to send missionaries to Singapore from Africa, some of them will go supported by the church, paid by the church. Others will go to do professional work, therefore they will not be paid by the church. But both of them are going to bring a, a spiritual difference in that country. That's really what you are talking about when you talk about um, when you are talking about uh, uh, tent making. It is simply witnessing without being paid by the church or the mission board. Yes, like I'm saying, every Christian, every professional is expected to be a witness. Jesus addressing the first church promised them power 
That's what we have just read. Then he described the mandate as being his witness. So you can't say, but I'm waiting for a call. If the moment you are saved, the moment you receive the Holy Spirit, the calling to be a witness is automatic. Now, maybe the call to be to move away from one country to another, the call to be a pastor, the call to do whatever else, that may be a specific call. But every all of us born again have the call to be a witness. You will be my witness. But let me just look at a few things that have to do with this. This pastor or missionary versus the tent maker. We each need to be using the gifts God has given us. And we need both church employees and tent makers, is what I'm saying. You know, in every church, there are witnesses. Some are church employees, others are tent makers. Unfortunately, there is a third group. Many, and unfortunately, it turns out to be the majority. That's why this ministry of um, Reverend Olisa is so important. We need to mobilize anybody who claims to be born again to take his responsibility. And if we don't, God will hold us responsible for not discipling people right. Proper discipleship should make every new believer understand he has joined the army of the Lord. The difference between a believer who simply lives and works as a professional and a tent maker is the intent and desire and practice to spread the gospel and make disciples. So there are people in the church who are so happy to be born again, so happy to be walking with the Lord, so enjoying the favor of God, that and the only tithe, the support mission work, but they themselves are not making any difference in terms of witnessing. So this that group are people in the church who will tithe, they will support missions, but they themselves will play no role in extending God's kingdom. I keep telling them, have you ever heard of anybody who got saved through money? Nobody. Even if you gave a million naira or whatever, a million dollars, and there is nobody willing to go, people will not get saved. Nations will not be discipled. Money is important, useful, keep giving it, but does not replace your role as a witness. So this that group is the group I'm addressing myself to. People who just enjoy being Christians and don't have any intent. What is intent? A desire to bring a difference in your place of work for the kingdom of God. A desire to bring a difference in your clan among your relatives, a desire to bring a difference in the neighborhood where you are, you are resident. Intent is the beginning of everything. Then a desire, not just intent, you now go to a desire and then practice the spreading of the gospel. That's really what you are talking about. So we have talked about three groups. People who are employed by the church or the mission board, people who, who, who are, who are who pay themselves and support themselves, and then people who are idle. And I want to talk to you if you're in that group. You need a change. We are still answering the question, who is a tent maker? We will describe you as a dedicated, spiritually mature Christian man or woman. Because there's a sign of immaturity to be a Christian. And you cannot, you can look at the last one week, the last one month, and you have not witnessed to anybody. You are just happy that you are doing a good job and you are tithing. But a tent maker is a person who is not employed by the church, but is dedicated and spiritually mature Christian, man or woman, who views work in the light of the Great Commission. In other words, he sees the job he is doing in the light of the Great Commission and work as an opportunity to serve the kingdom of God. He sees, wow, once he gets a job in um, Lagos, he says, wow, I'm now going to work for the Lord in Lagos, although the employer is not employing him to be a witness. You know, tent, a tent maker or tent making 
provides substantial means of developing relationships. That's why it's so important to do tent making. In fact, you can be a pastor, but you can't reach the kind of people tent makers can reach. You just come to share, share, be, share where I was working, and you come at the door and you are wearing a dog collar as a pastor. They will not allow you there beyond that point. But if you are an engineer, they will see how, how you can be a consultant with them. It is working in an organization that gives you ability to develop relationships that finally become new believers. And so if we, had, if we trusted only the pastors to be the one to evangelize, we will have a lot of limitations. But if you now plant yourself in various industries, you develop relationship. Because you are, you are secretary, you are, uh, uh, you are relating. You are boss, you are relating. You are colleague, you are relating. It is an opportunity. The workplace is, a, is an opportunity to develop a relationship. Number two, credibility. My friend, if you are a banker and you are the one people come to for any help because you are a professional in balancing the books, you gain credibility so that by the time you turn around and tell the person, I love Jesus, you do. Because there is a general feeling like Christians are not serious people. But now once you realize this person who has been helping you is a Christian, he makes it much easier for you to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, it creates context for ministry. And that's what I've done all my life. You know, the other day I was doing a, a workshop for, 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 a, for, a, for, a, for, for a business. And after I finished doing the workshop, you know, young people say, oh, Mr. Nganga, can you be my mentor? And obviously, I, uh, since it was not a Christian atmosphere, I called that a contact, a developer relationship. So I took his phone and I told him, don't worry, we will, I'll buy you tea. So I bought the young man, the young man tea. During the tea time, he said, you know, I want you to be my mentor. I would like you to, I would like to grow in industry. The way you are able to reach at the top leadership of Shell in Kenya, can't you also help me go there? I said, I didn't tell you everything. The reason why I was able to progress professionally is because I knew Jesus. In addition to doing a good job, I trusted myself in God. And if you really want to be like me, young man, you need to have both. You need to know the Lord if you really want to progress professionally. And I told him, think about it. He said, no, no, no. I'm becoming a Christian. At the same place where we're in the, ho in the hotel, we actually ended up praying for him. And now he is walking with the Lord. My friend, that kind of contact I would not have gotten if it were not for the fact that I'm involved in, in consultancy work. And I'm dealing, I'm meeting all kinds of people in all kinds of places. I now want you to go back to your groups. And number one, in that group, share an example of a tent maker you admire and why. It's not a discussion. You just share, share, you are talking to one another in order to show that this tent making is a real thing. Share an example of a person who fits in what I've just described. It may be you, if it's your personal testimony, give it. Or it may be somebody else. Share the, share the testimony. And um, the number, number two question, share the challenges you or him or she has had to overcome in trying to be both an engineer and doing ministry. And then share any successes, like I've just shared mine, as a tent maker. I do not know whether uh, how, to, how to deal with a group. Um, Taraba, can you help me organize people into groups? Or is it that they can talk as um, people can just volunteer and we, we act as one group? I'm waiting for help on how to discuss.
Hello? Hello? Yeah, they are, they are on ground, so they will, they will do the group. How many minutes are they having for the group? Ten minutes? Only ten minutes. Only ten minutes. All right. Ten minutes, so we are back at twelve. Go to the group. Go to our group, sir.